Hello and welcome to this, the sixth video in the Historic Pubs of Wales series, coming to you for a reason which will become apparent from both Cardiff and Caerphilly. Today I'm going to be answering a question which I'm sure keeps you awake at night, and that is, what has been the contribution of the humble pub to the criminal justice system through history? We're starting here in Caerphilly because just around the corner from where I am right now, there is a pub that used to be a court of law. That may sound odd, but it's not an isolated example. Some of the better known examples being the Hundred House in Bledva, the Welcome in Llanrydion, and probably most famously, the Skirid Inn in Llanfihangwyl Crucorni. The Skirid is an interesting one. The reason it boasts an established inn date of 1110 is because of a record of the trial of a man called John Crowther taking place at an inn in the village in that year. The building which houses the Skirid these days is old, but most likely late 17th century, so feel free to draw your own conclusions about that one. Claims are also made that a trial was held here as part of the Bloody Assizes after the Monmouth Rebellion of 1685. The presiding judge, Judge Jeffreys, earned himself the nickname the Hanging Judge on account of his rather uniform approach to sentencing. And the story goes that he hung 180 local men from the beams of the Skirid Inn, and the scorch marks from the ropes can still be seen on the roof beams in the hall to this day. So, wells as old as inns were quite frequently used as courts of law, and there's a very good reason for that. Up until the Industrial Revolution, most small towns and villages didn't have public buildings as such, only the church, and that was purely for religious use. So, anything that needed to be looked at for secular use, the inn was really the only place where it could take place. So they were used as courts, as tribunals, administrative centres, rent review offices, estate offices, livestock auctions, even morgues. The pubs along the heritage coast would frequently find their tables weighed down with dead bodies. Whenever a wreck would wash up on any number of submerged hazards out in the Bristol Channel, that might have caused you quite a stir if you just popped in for a swift pint. So in line with this theme, the court in Caerphilly also known as the courthouse, was built on what was known as a burgage plot. That's a rectangular parcel of land at right angles to a main street or thoroughfare, very common in the medieval period. Part of the castle's old south gate stands on the edge of the beer garden, but when it was first built, this whole building would have been within the castle defences. One of its most interesting features is its stone roof, hand-chipped stone tiles made from the same stone used to build the castle, very unusual for buildings of this age in this part of South Wales, which would have been more commonly thatched. As with all buildings of this age, though, what you're looking at has been altered and extended down the centuries, but as much as it's something of a hodgepodge of architectural styles now, at its heart, this building is a 14th century courthouse, where criminal proceedings were heard and local people stood in search of justice. The medieval period was a very interesting one for criminal justice. Many of the legal maxims we associate with British law even today originate from here. Things like innocent until proven guilty, the right to remain silent and the right to be tried by a jury of your peers were enshrined in the Magna Carta of 1215. Incidentally, so was a clause which made the pint the official quantity in which you buy beer. As lofty and enlightened as those principles might sound, that had very little to do with the type of justice that was dispensed here. That was for knights and nobles. If you were just an ordinary peasant, as 99% of the population were back then, then you faced an altogether more rudimentary approach to justice. Ordinary people were tried by what were known as trials by ordeal. What were they, you may well ask? Well, people in the medieval period were altogether more religious than we are these days. In fact, in their eyes, nothing ever happened by chance or coincidence. Everything that ever happened, from the swooping of a swallow to the collapse of a kingdom, happened because it was God's will. So trials by ordeal were a way of establishing if someone charged with a crime was innocent or guilty by looking for some divine intervention. For example, there was the ordeal by fire. In this, the accused had to hold burning hot irons in their hands. Their wounds were bound in rags and they were thrown into a cell for a week. At the end of the week, the rags were removed. If their wounds had healed cleanly, it was an indication of innocence. If they blistered, it was a sure sign of guilt and they were dispatched accordingly. Pretty brutal, I'm sure you'd agree. But there is at least a semblance of logic to it. Unlike the ordeal by water, in that, the accused was tied to a chair 
and submerged in the waters of the lake. If, when brought to the surface, they had survived, it meant they had been rejected by the baptismal waters, a sure sign of their guilt, so they were dispatched accordingly. But if, on the other hand, when brought to the surface, they had drowned, then that was a sure sign of their innocence, and presumably they were free to go, albeit their celebrations might have been tempered, what with being dead. So in Caerphilly we have an example of a 14th century inn being used as a dispensary of justice. This practice did not just happen here though. For our next example, let us travel eight miles south of Caerphilly to Roth in Cardiff and fast forward 300 years to the Tudor period because there is a tradition which brings together pubs and the criminal justice system in quite a unique way and it has contributed to the richness of the English language. Let me explain. I lived for many years in central Cardiff and always knew that this crossroads at the top of City Road was known locally as Death Junction, but I always assumed that was because it was a dangerous road junction with five roads rather than four in a crossroads. In reality, the name is far older than Cardiff's traffic. In fact, it dates back to when this was not even technically a part of Cardiff. It was a very rural area, surrounded by farmland. It was known as Plucker Lane, and this is where the Cardiff gallows were erected for public hangings. There's a plaque on the outside of the NatWest Bank here, commemorating the execution of two Catholic priests, called Philip Evans and John Lloyd in 1679. They were convicted of conspiring to assassinate Charles II, but history suggests this might have been something of a fit-up. Both were canonised in 1970. We may all be familiar with the site of the Victorian prison in Cardiff, built predominantly in the 19th century and still in use today in nearby Knox Road. But back when the gallows at Plucker Lane were in use, the old Cardiff jail was on a site now occupied by Cardiff's indoor market, right in the centre of the city in St Mary Street. There also used to be a town hall in the middle of St Mary Street, near where the Castle Arcade is now, which is where criminal trials in Cardiff were held in this period. When execution day came, usually on a Sunday after church, there was a certain amount of ceremony attached to the proceedings. Hangings were held in public. The idea might turn our stomachs now, but from the 15th to the 18th century, they were seen as good, clean family entertainment. And vast crowds used to turn out to watch them, both at the gallows themselves and along the streets the cortege of the condemned man would take to get there. There was a tradition attached to the procession of the condemned man, which has given us a few unexpected expressions still in use in common language today. To spare the condemned man the worst elements of pain that he was about to endure, there was a tradition, and that was that the procession going from Cardiff Jail to Plucker Lane should take the most indirect route and stop at every single pub on the way. The cortege consisting of the condemned man, his executioner, his chaplain, his guards, would all clamber onto a wagon which would wend its way out of Cardiff Jail and stop at the first pub, even if that was just a few steps away. On stopping, the cortege would descend and go into the pub, have a few drinks, get back onto the wagon and carry on to the next. There are only two members of the cortege who are not able to indulge themselves in the drinking spree. They were the people who still had a job left to do, namely the chaplain and the executioner. So while everyone carried on on this pub call, they stayed on the wagon. So if you've ever to offer to buy somebody an alcoholic drink, and they've replied, not for me thanks, I'm on the wagon, it is these two abstaining souls that they are referencing. And that's not the only expression that this tradition has given us. The wagon earned itself the nickname of the lurch on account of how frequently it stopped, uh, referencing the lunging motion as the horses started moving off and the brake slamming everyone forward as it stopped. If you've ever used the expression left in the lurch, meaning to be excluded or left out, once again, this is the tradition that you are referencing. There are even suggestions that the expression pub crawl is derived from the pace that this wagon would move at when moving towards its ultimate destination. So there we have it, the historic pubs of Wales. So much more than just a place to pop in and buy a pint. They have been dispensaries of historic justice. I really hope you've enjoyed this video where we've been exploring all that used to go on 
Uh, if you did, please feel free to share it on social media and don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you get notified of other videos as we upload more and more content about the history of South Wales. Um, everything that we've covered in today's uh, issue has been written about in more depth in this book. So if you want more information about the sort of history tied up in our oldest pubs, then this book, The Historic Pubs of Wales, is available on Amazon and all uh, independent bookshops. But look, until the next time that we meet, please enjoy your history. <laughs>